Uh, let's start here quick. So just a quick recap of where we were in, uh, on Wednesday's class when I spoke with you, and then I'll also show you how Tyler's stuff that he covered on Friday fits in. On Wednesday, we were looking at um, this new section in, our, in this part of the course where we're looking at cost estimation. And we're doing a cost estimation at various stages of a project. There's one point in time where you're doing a cost estimate right at the early days where you're just judging feasibility of a, pro a project. This is when you're simply just deciding if this is worthwhile. It's no different to an example I gave in an earlier class where you might be deciding if you'd want to open a restaurant in the city or not. You're simply deciding whether it's, it's worthwhile. And so we need some basic correlations to judge that. If you're still interested in, in that project after you do that preliminary cost estimate, then you go to more detailed design and sizing of the equipment. And then you get to what we call FOB costs. We're going to cover that in today's class, what that term means. And if you're still going ahead with the project after this stage, your estimates get, get less and less error. And you get to a proposal stage where you now go out to contractors and start asking for, for quotes that are more accurate. But up until this stage, all of this cost estimation is done on your own as the engineer. And we had looked at a variety of costs in the class last week. One was, of course, the fixed equipment costs and working capital. I'll cover those again today. Tyler, on Friday's class, considered these manufacturing costs, ongoing costs while the plant is operating. And just to maybe give you a bit of an idea of, of that, um, let me perhaps look at it in this sense, just to introduce the terminology. You've seen this, uh, this graph before, where we plot NPV over time. So I've got time progressing over there and NPV, so re remember NPV is a dollar figure. In the early days of deciding to go build a plant, you're spending significant amounts of capital to get that equipment purchased, brought to the site, and installed. Then you decide to start running the plant and turning it on. So you need some catalysts, some raw materials, just to get started. And we call that the working capital. Okay, so that's that working capital term that's in the slides over there. Um, up below fixed equipment is working capital. It's a little bit cut off. But um, fixed equipment costs then are essentially these costs that you spend in, the, in this period of time. So we'll call this FCC, fixed capital costs. And then you turn your plant on, you start producing money. Oh, sorry, you start producing product and selling that and get some cash flow coming in. But you also have expenses to run that equipment. So that was what Tyler's class was on Friday, was how do you estimate those incomes and expenses? Essentially, Tyler looked at those cost estimates that are going to run throughout the life of the plant. What we're looking at in today's class and over the next few classes is this upfront cost, the FCC. How do you estimate those capital costs just to get started? Okay. So you would, you would do this NPV analysis in, in your work as an engineer. You'd also, you're doing this in your groups for the course project in 4N, which we'll talk about in, uh, in a later class this week. So, FCC then is fixed capital costs. And if we want to estimate those fixed capital costs, there's, there's two ways that we might uh, do, do so. They're very rough. The first is the turnover ratio. So the turnover ratio works as follows. It says you need to know what your gross annual sales are going to be. Now that's an easy number to figure out. Let's say you're going to make propylene as your product. And you're going to build a plant that produces 100, 100 tons per day of that material. 100 tons per day times the selling price of propylene gets you your gross annual sales. So it's very easy to get the right hand side. Well, how do you calculate your fixed capital costs? Take fixed capital costs and divide it by this number, uh, turnover ratio here on the left. So bring the turnover ratio 
over to the right hand side. And in the process industries, that's a number of 0.5, typically. Okay. Now let's, let's think what that says. It says that, let's say you estimate gross annual sales to be $100 million. It's going to cost about $200 million to build that plant. Okay? You don't need to look up any other information except knowing how much you're going to make as your income. <coughs> Divided by 0.5, and you'll get a very crude answer that tells you how much it's going to cost to build that plant. And that's why it's called the turnover ratio, because it tells you how many times you turn over your sales through your plant. Okay? So the number of times we turn our capital into sales, I should say, rather. That would be a better way of saying it. So how do you turn your capital costs into sales? Well, let's... Let's take the reverse. If it costs $200 million, you're going to have to operate for two years just to get the money to pay back just the capital. Okay, never mind other ongoing expenses, but two years of sales are going to be turned around to pay for the capital. Other industries can have turnover ratios that are, are quite a bit more aggressive or more generous at the 4.0 level. So coffee shops, restaurants, they have different turnover ratios. Chemical plants, that number is about 0.5. Every industry has a turnover ratio that you can go calculate. In the chemical industry, that number is about a half. So that's our very first very crude estimate. And when you report that answer, uh, let's say you'll say, let's give um, some rough numbers here. Let's say sales were $5 billion. So then your fixed capital cost estimate is $10 billion. That's not the number you tell your boss. You tell your boss the numbers between the lower and upper bound. So if you're going to estimate fixed capital costs of 10 billion, you tell your boss it's going to cost about 5 billion to 20 billion dollars to build this plant. And your boss is going to say, well, that's no good to me. You can't tell me something's going to cost between 5 billion and 20 billion. I need something a bit more specific. But this is what this turnover ratio is all about. It's just a very crude, rough number. The next number that we look at, um, and we started to consider this actually last week, you may not have realized this, is we looked at, essentially I'd asked you to look at the, these diagrams. Recall there's a, a, an autoclave out on a flatbed truck for delivery. So the delivered cost is the cost of that unit plus the delivery. And then let's say you, once you've installed that autoclave, you have a variety of other costs. And we went through a, a long list of about 25, 30 I, other costs that go into that process. So things like walkways, safety, heating, cooling, electricity, paint. Um, we went through a, a long, long list on Wednesday's class last week. So that's the fixed capital cost. So is there a way that we can relate delivery cost to fixed capital cost? Well, there it is over here. If you take your delivery cost of the equipment and multiply it by a number that's four, you get your fixed capital costs. Okay? Think, uh, now think about that interpretation as well. If you're spending a million dollars on a piece of equipment just to deliver the equipment and the cost of the equipment itself, by the time that equipment's up and running, you actually have to spend four million. Okay? The cost of getting things up and running and installed and working properly is far, far greater than the equipment itself. And, and that was what Wednesday's class, when we went through that list, made, made you realize that quite quickly. Now, it is a little bit different. Can anyone think of, and maybe just discuss, why it would be a little bit more for a fluids processing plant than a solids processing plant? Take a minute to maybe think about it. Yeah, Niall? Oh, uh, um, no, so what we're saying is that for a fluids processing plant, that factor isn't, is, is a higher number. It's a factor of five for a fluids processing plant. So a fluids processing plant costs a lot more for the same pieces of equipment than it would for a solids processing plant. What is the difference between solids and fluids? Yeah. 
harder to store. Why specifically? Sean? Can evaporate. Fluids leak. They disappear. They're <laughs> operated higher temperatures and pressures. Solids processing plants, we typically deal with solids at ambient conditions. So all of those reasons lead to higher costs for fluids processing. Higher temperatures, pressures, corrosion becomes an issue. Okay. So fluids are more costly to deal with. So two very crude methods to estimate the FCC, the fixed capital costs. Knowing you don't have to have a flow sheet. You don't have to know anything else about the plant and the technology behind it. It's a very simple, very crude estimate to get in that FCC. So it's good for, for screening between alternative decisions on where to invest your capital. Now, let's take a look at this diagram. And this is where we're going to spend our time, probably for the next week and a bit, understanding how we estimate capital costs. What we're going to do is the following. Let's say, let's come back to this idea of, of operating a restaurant. Okay? Your friend perhaps has a restaurant in the city and they bought a stove five years ago. You need to purchase that same stove. Or let's, let's just work with that same stove. And your friend is happy to tell you that that stove cost the restaurant $100,000 five years ago. Okay. That's what we call our historical cost. Now, if you want to estimate without having to phone up the stove vendor and asking for an estimate, but you would just like a quick answer, the easiest way to get that is, of course, just to take the price of the $100,000 stove five years ago and adjust it for inflation for today. Okay, so we, we're very comfortable with that idea, and that's what that inflation term is. But now let's say that your friend's stove was made from carbon steel, but you need to make your stove from stainless steel. Okay, stainless steel costs more than carbon steel. So you know your, pro your stove is not only going to cost more for inflation for five years, but also because it's operating at, sorry, it's, it's also made from a different material. It's more expensive. So instead of just in adjusting for inflation, you're also going to increase the price by s in some way for the material of construction. If your stove had to operate at higher temperatures, typically, and needs to be more durable, there will be an additional factor for that. Okay? So it's no difference for chemical plants. Chemical plants, we have very, very good records of what our equipment costs us, especially internal to a company. They'll keep good records and quality control um, of their, all their equipment. So when I say quality control, not only do they know where they bought the equipment from, how much it costs, they've got the entire maintenance history. And with the newer technologies, all those equipments are fully instrumented. So we now are even able to predict when pumps will fail and, and go replace them before they fail. Okay? So we, we're actually a lot smarter about this because of our, our more sophisticated databases and data tracking. So we, we have the historical cost of equipment available, and there are companies who collect this information and make it, make it available to us. So we can always get this number. So if we're buying a pump, and our database tells us that that pump back in 1970 was made from carbon steel for low pressure, low temperature, we can still use that value. We don't have to say, well, my, my pump isn't the same as that one. You can still take the pump that was made in 1970, for example, adjust for inflation, adjust for temperature, adjust for pressure, adjust for material of construction. Okay? There's another term that we have to adjust for, capacity. The pump that we may have bought in 1970 in our company was therefore 100 meters cubed an hour. But if we need a pump that's 200 meters cubed an hour, should we assume that the price is double? No. Okay. More than double, less than double? Less than double, OK? So we, we're very comfortable with this idea that if you buy something that's a little bit bigger, it's not going to be scale linearly. There's an exponential scaling factor there. So that's what all of this is about. And that's what we're going to cover in today's class, is that, that first step. And our goal is then to get what we call FOB, 
Anyone heard the term FOB? Yeah, two, three people. Okay, take out your phones and quickly look up FOB and see what it means. Okay, any interpretations that you get there? FOB. You've just read about it, so... Nope. Nothing. Yeah, Sean? Would it be a term when you're shipping and trading between organizations or countries and borders and stuff? Okay, it's a term that involves sh uh, shipping it, it does involve borders and boundaries. It's basically FOB sets where the seller's responsibility ends and the buyer's responsibility begins is really what it comes down to. Okay, so when I've bought equipment in, in the past, the terms were FOB Osaka Airport. Okay. What that meant was that the seller was going to drop the equipment off at Osaka's airport. I was responsible for getting it from that airport into Canada and delivered and installed. Okay, FOB tells you where the cost lands up on the seller side or on the buyer side. Now obviously it would be great if every supplier said FOB at your company's <coughs> facility. Okay, that means that they're paying for shipping, costs, insurance, delivery, right up to your site. But most companies, their terms are FOB at their loading docks. They say, I'll put this, the equipment on my loading dock. You are then responsible for coming to pick it up from that point and, and take it onwards. Okay, so FO, FOB is the demarcation for insurance, for ownership. Okay, and that's very important. One thing you must always make sure of is up to which point in time and location is the owner of that equipment designated. So it depends on who FOB, that's important then, right? If FOB is, in that example, Osaka Airport, I would be responsible for import costs from Japan to Canada. Okay, but if FOB for that company was Mississauga and a specific address, then they're obviously responsible for getting it from Japan to Mississauga, and they would be paying for import costs. Okay, so FOB is, is an important concept because it involves topics like ownership, insurance, and import duties. Okay, so what we want, we want is this idea of an FOB cost. Once we get the equipment to our site, we need to install it and, and have it delivered, perhaps take it from the FOB point onto our site, so we need to pay that shipping, and then once we get it to our site, we need to install it. And that's going to give us a bare module cost. I'm going to show you what a bare module cost is in a minute. Once we have that bare module cost, we'll add in some contractor fees and contingencies, but those are much smaller and we get the total cost at the end. So here's the idea of a bare module cost. Here's a heat exchanger on a pallet, strapped up, and it's at the FOB point. Okay, so this might be at the loading docks of the vendor, the person who's selling the, the heat exchanger. And I may have paid a million dollars for that piece of equipment at the FOB site. All the costs then for bringing that heat exchanger to my location and then I have to hook up, sorry, I have to first unpack it, I then have to hook up all the piping, the utilities, I have to add sensors, I have to paint those pipes and insulate them perhaps, um, instrumentation, 
all of those costs within a region that's about three meters by three meters by three meters is considered the bare module cost. It's often for painting and for consistency, yeah. Yeah, yeah for, cor for corrosion would be the main reason, right? But um, all of those costs then within about a three meter radius of the equipment are considered the bare module cost. So there absolutely is piping and sensors and instrumentation foundations that this equipment rests on. Um, as you can see here, steel structural supports around it. All of those are the bare module costs. Okay, so when we're estimating that, that uh, bare module cost, that is the cost we're estimating. Okay, and there's a list of, of what some of the items include, though it is mentioned here in small print on the illustration. Now, this is the way we're going to, to work with these problems. We're going to go look up a cost from a database. So as I said before, we have these databases available. Companies and textbooks provide historical costs for equipment. And that, that database takes various forms. It could be an image, like a figure that shows a plot of the values. It could be an equation that tells you the cost of the equipment given a certain capacity factor. And I'll talk, talk about what that, how that's related in a minute and we're going to get that number and we're going to then scale it up we're going to scale it up for capacity this is the idea that you just have this intuitive understanding for right now that a, a heat exchanger that's double the size of another heat exchanger isn't necessarily going to be double the cost so if my database calls for a heat exchanger that's a hundred meters squared but my heat exchanger is actually 200 meters squared in area well that's that capacity factor that I've got a larger unit or a smaller unit that I need to cost estimate for. I'm going to take inflation into account. I'm going to take installation into account. And if I need to operate that equipment at higher temperatures or pressures or make the equipment from a different material of construction, that's going to go into this last multiplier. Here's something interesting about that correlation here that I want you to just pick up on is that it's multiplicative in the terms. It's not additive. Okay. So when you take the database cost from your historical data, you don't add extra cost for capacity. You don't add extra cost for inflation. You multiply. Okay. So if you're building a larger heat exchanger that's got a higher capacity than your database heat exchanger, you obviously expect that multiplier to be greater than 1 would be something like 1.5. Okay, if it's smaller, it's, it's a number smaller than 1. If you've got a cost estimate from the 1980s and you're bringing it up to today's, that's obviously a, a positive, a, a number that's greater than 1. Okay, so you, you're, you're inflating the costs. Um, the operating conditions, if you're operating at higher temperatures, higher pressures, from more expensive materials of construction, then these are positive, uh, so I should say, numbers that are greater than 1 again. Okay. So it's all always multi multiplicative. Now, let's take a look at that very first capacity factor. So I'm just going to focus on that term for now and ignore the others. And we'll, we'll slowly build this up. So the capacity factor says take a piece of equipment at one capacity. Let's call that B. So we know our existing heat exchanger has an existing capacity factor B. We know we want to design a new heat exchanger. Let's call that A with a new capacity factor A. We take the ratio of that to the power N, and that gives us the ratio of costs. Let me just uh, um, show you where that equation comes from. It's, it's a little bit of a simplification of the following. It simply is a ratio of that cost is factored to the n. Okay? So we would simply ratio it in the numerator and the denominator. So if I write that equation for, for unit A, I could also write that same equation for unit B. Okay? 
Okay, and then just ratio it like that. So, so that equation is just a simplified version of the ratio of two individual equations. And I'll show you, in fact, where that um, numerator equation and that denominator equations come from. Now let me just talk a little bit about capacity factor here. The, the term capacity factor is got to be related to a physical aspect of the equipment that correlates with cost. Okay, let me repeat that. Every piece or every type of equipment has a factor that correlates with cost. So, for example, the easiest one that you might consider is a storage tank. What aspect of the storage tank best correlates with cost? Volume? Size, okay. So, let's be specific. It's, it's, when you say size, you, you're probably meaning volume. Yeah, so it's not the height of the tank. It's not the diameter of the tank. It is the volume of the tank that correlates with cost. So a tank with a greater volume has a greater cost. Okay? With heat exchangers, you're, I've, kind of, I've used that as an ongoing example. It's the surface area of the heat exchanger that correlates with cost. Okay? It's not, for example, it's not the flow rate through the heat exchanger that correlates with cost. Why, why is it not the flow rate that correlates with cost? Right. You can change the flow rate, operate at a higher flow rate, the cost doesn't change. Okay. But if you want a higher area of heat exchange, you have to pay more money for it. Okay, so the, it, this is not something you have to pick. <coughs> Typically, when you go look this up in your database, your database will have the factor there for you. But... This is something you do need to be aware of, aware of because I'll show you later on that sometimes when you go to the database, there's two correlations for, for a piece of equipment. And each correlation uses a different factor. Okay, so it's a little bit of a subtlety. I'll talk about it in, in an upcoming class. But in general, you have to pick a factor that correlates with cost. And so let's maybe uh, think of another example, a distillation column. Discuss with someone next to you what is the factor in a distillation col column that correlates with the cost of that unit that you would expect. Okay, there's some other units, so not only uh, discuss a distillation column, discuss those five other units there. Okay, let's, uh, let's perhaps work from the bottom up. Any suggestions for a filter? Filter press. 
surface area, okay? So a filter or filter press, um, for those of you that have taken 4M, you've seen some pictures of it. If you haven't taken 4M or uh, don't remember what a filter looks like, just look at Google Images for a filter press and it's quite apparent it's the area of that device that's going to relate to cost. A motor. So electric motor, perhaps. RPM, power, or torque? Any one of those? Other comments? Yeah. Amps? Okay. So it's, it's power, kilowatts, generally correlates with the cost on a motor. A pump. Pressure difference, capacity, the pump's head, yeah, anything else? Okay, we'll, we'll get to this one, but a pump often just relies on a motor to drive it, and so the, the cost is, is also in, in terms of kilowatts or power, but a pump could also be, be costed, its factor could also be costed conceivably in throughput, so volumetric throughput. Okay, so there's an example of a unit that you could find two different correlations that relate the factor to the cost. A distillation column, any, any ideas around that one? This one's a little trickier. Trays. The number of trays, yeah. diameter. Okay, so a, lot, a, a, a greater diameter distillation column has a higher cost, Brandon? Tray loadings, okay. amount of mass on each tray, okay. But if you bought an, a column, they don't always know what you're putting into it, right, and how the flow rates, okay. So in a distillation column, the co capital cost is related often to the length multiplied by the diameter and the raised to the 1.5. So length multiplied by D to the 1.5. We'll see that, and that's typical of, of most column-based units, so a packed column, a distillation column, any column-based system has got that correlation. A furnace there is, uh, again, related to, to heating capacity. Okay. So we'll see our factors then are an important part of, what, of the information we need, and we're going to relate that to the cost in that, using that ratio. So... That's what the, these slides um, were, went on about. Um, so their distillation column, there's, there's a mistake here in your notes that should be height times diameter raised to the 1.5. Okay. And pumps could either be in volumetric flow rate or, or in power. Okay, now, I mean, where, where does this come from? Well, actually, you may not be aware of it, but um, one of the biggest... Um, sources of this information was here at McMaster University. Dr. Don Woods collected all this information um, and for those of you that have been in my office you see hundreds of his boxes of stuff that I inherited um, when he passed away and inside there this is one of these examples of the correlations that he had developed for a distillation column. So I'll just explain what he has on these, on these axes he has the log of the factor on the horizontal axis and he has the log of the price on the vertical axis. And what uh, Dr. Woods did was he wrote to a variety of companies and got quotes for, if we're dealing with a distillation column, he got a variety of quotes for a various number of factors and he plotted them on these two log-log axes and developed that line and that line has slope n. Okay. And we will use Dr. Woods' correlations in this course. We'll also use correlations from other sources, but that's essentially um, what he did. And if you, that, that is essentially just a restatement of that equation that I had up there earlier on the board. 
that the cost is equal to factor raised to the power n is, um, is what that, that graph says. So what you can do then is essentially, if you know the cost for unit B and unit A, let's say that is unit A and this is unit B, you can find out the cost of an, a unit of it with a different factor given the cost and the price for, an, for another unit. So let's uh, give that a try in an example. So the, the, before we get to the example, just to point out that that, that number n is usually 0.6. It's also known as the 6 tenths rule. But it is a good idea to go look up the actual exponent for various equipment because it's not always 6 tenths for every equipment. If you have absolutely no idea what the exponent is, then using 6 tenths is quite OK. But we can do better than that. So let's take a look then at this example. I'll just quickly work through it. We don't um, need to do it manually here. Here we've got a motor with capacity of 175 horsepower. We would like to estimate the cost for that, for that motor. We know, however, a motor with 100 horsepower cost $4,500. Okay, so we can ratio our new unit A to our existing unit B. And in my new, my new motor has 175 horsepower. My existing motor has 100 horsepower B on the left-hand side or right-hand side. The exponent for electric motors is 0.81. We'll look that up on tables. I'll show you one of those tables in Wednesday's class. And if we ratio those factors, the horsepower and horsepower units cancel out. So this is dimensionless number over here raised to the power 0.81. And we get a new cost of 7084 for that motor. Okay? Now, it's not going to cost you 7080 We will look at later on. We actually will never report this number on its own. We'll report a lower bound and an upper bound. We'll always report a range. Any questions on that so far? OK. Yes, sure. Uh, no, the, uh, each unit will have different error limits. Okay, and we'll, we'll show some of those later on. Yeah, Hassan. Yeah, if I ask you, um, the couple times that in the demonstration problem, you said it's high times diameter to the power of 1.5. Yeah. Is it all the way to the power of 1.5 or is that? Just diameter. So 1.5. Okay, so, so that's the, that is the one part of that equation. So just to go back and recap. We've looked at taking the database price and then updating that database price for a new capacity. So either a higher capacity or a lower capacity. Let's take a look actually at the next term, the inflation factor. The inflation factor is a number that is greater than 1, unless you're going backwards in time. But generally, we're taking an old price and bringing it to, the, to an, a later date. So that number there will always be above 1. Let's investigate just that, that third entry in that equation. So what we use there are a variety of indexes to do that. You, we could, a very naive approach could be to say, we know that the, the um, average inflation rate is about 3 to 4%. Uh, let's just take a rough number. And if we had the price of the equipment in 1970, we might apply a 3% inflation to go take the price from 1970 to 1971, and then take another 3% inflation to go from 71 to 72, and keep going like that until we get to the desired point in time that we want. But that's, that's not right, okay? Because that inflation rate that we use is for the entire Canada, and it's for people buying regular goods and services, okay? It is not for a chemical industry. The inflation rate for the chemical industry and building those plants and buying those units in the plant is, is quite different. And so we have actually a variety of indexes to, to pick from. So the way these indexes are developed is that some, some company, or it's usually a journal publication, 
So each one of these indexes appear in, in a different journal. So this one comes from chemical engineering. This third index, the Nelson Farrow index, comes from the oil and gas journal. What these, what these companies have done is that they've t arbitrarily taken a point in time and put the index at 100. So for example, Marshall and Swift was equal to 100 in 1926. And that's just arbitrary. They said, if you built a plant in 1926, it might cost a certain value, and let's fix that index at 100. If you built that plant later on, now the index has gone from 100 to 300. So it says essentially the plant costs you three times the amount, going from 1926 to 1970. Okay. We can also look at that index in 1970, 80, 90, 2000. But what we'll most often use is we'll ratio it against the 1970 point. That's going to be our reference point. Now it seems a little bit weird. Why 1970? Well, 1970 is a reference point where a lot of the correlations are just established against. Okay? It's, it's an arbitrary point in time. And even Aspen Icarus and a lot of the electronic estimation systems will do that as well. They'll simply report the value in current day, but their baseline is an arbitrary point in time, usually in the 1970s. So what we need to do is understand these correlations, sorry, I should say these indexes, to get our price updates. So what we notice here, let me just take as an example with each of these four indexes here, we've reported the ratio of the index in the year 2000 to the index value in 1970. And all of them you see numbers of about 3.64, 3.2. So it, is, it says that to build a new chemical plant of the same type with the same technology as in 1970 would cost you this multiplier in today's money. Okay? So that's where that multiplier term comes from. So when, you, when you're wanting that multiplier, that inflation factor, when you look up your database price, not only do you look up your database price, you also have to look up your database time. So if that price is for a pump in 1970, you have to choose the correct inflation factor to go from 1970 to 2014. If the database, for example, was for a pump in the year 2000, you, you would use a different inflation factor over here to simply go from 2000 to 2014. Okay? So inflation very much, that inflation factor is very much dependent on the, the reference year that your database comes from. And there's a bit of a historical trend for these indexes. And you can see all of them generally rise with the same, same rough trend. And the reason why they, they sort of just seem offset from each other is because each one of them has a different year where they were arbitrarily set at 100. Okay, so this index was arbitrarily set at 100 in 1926, this one in 46, this one in 58, and this one in 67. So essentially, though, they follow the same trends, just shifted around a bit. And on the course website is a link. I'll just show you the, the Excel file. Uh, looks something like this. I've, re I've recorded these index values going back to the 1950s for you, all the way till 2013. And you can see similar trends, but not quite the same. And the reason is this. Each of these indexes specializes themselves in a, in a certain way. So for example, the nelson Farrer index is for, um, as said there, is for refineries. Marshall and Swift is for the process industries. Chemical engineering plant cost index is, for, is exactly what it says there, for chemical engineering plants. And engineering news record index is for a more general engineering type plant. So we will only use the CEPCI, chemical engineering plant cost index. We won't use Marshall and, Sh and Swift, even though when we're doing cost estimates, they are for the process industries in this course. The problem is Marshall and Swift has become a private company now, and they don't publish that index anymore, unless you pay them lots of money to get the number. Okay, so CEPCI is published in, uh, in the journal called Chemical Engineering. Uh, there's a journal with just that name, Chemical Engineering, and that CEPCI is published annually in the, in the 
last few pages of the journal so we can go look it up and we can use that one a lot more readily than Marshall and Swift, which is now propriety. Okay, so give that a, give that a try over there. Um, this is a really easy problem. Calculate the cost of a distillation column in 2011 when you know the 1979 cost of the distillation column was 65690 Okay, so the, it works intuitively because the way those indexes work is that they're, so they're just they're ratios. So essentially it says that the cost of a unit in 1979 ratioed to the inflation factor in 2011 is equal to the ratio of the cost in 2011 to the cost in 1979. Okay, so an inflation factor is essentially just a scaled cost. So if we ratio it that way, then you can calculate that the cost in 2011 is equal to the cost in 1979 multiplied by the inflation factor ratios okay and in this problem the numbers are 65 690 and the numerator is 1490 and the denominator is 607 Yeah? Sorry? Why would I have an N value? Okay, so this is, the, this, is, this is not related to capacity, right? Capacity is where the N value comes in, right? This is related to inflation. Inflation scales just in that way, right? So in this answer, it was $161,250. So the price has gone up quite, quite a bit from the 1979 cost. Okay, so this, unit, this example uses Marshall and Swift. In general, we'll use CEPCI, though. Okay, so we'll take that on in the next class.